Welcome to the Aiki Dojo Podcast. I'm David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles, and with me is... Mike Van Ruth, Aikido Fourth Dawn, Aiki, uh, Yaido Fourth Dawn. And Bill D'Angelo, Aikido Fourth Dawn. So, Sensei, uh, I thought uh, for today's uh, podcast that we could uh, talk about the philosophy of Aikido. How many hours do we have? Yeah, <laughs> this is going to be a deep subject, baby. <laughs> well, what do you want to know? Well, uh, I think it would be good to maybe start with what your philosophy of Aikido is. And then we could branch out from there. I've got some ideas and some things about Osensei's philosophy. Well, uh, my, my philosophy of Aikido is different than a lot of other people's philosophies of Aikido. Uh, merely because of where, we, where I am in my own training, right? Like... Uh, Osensei's philosophy, nonviolence and things like that, that's that's the goal, right? That's the big picture, enlightenment level Aikido. But uh, each person's philosophy of Aikido should be different at every stage in their training, right? So if you're a uh, Q-ranked student, your, your uh, philosophy of Aikido should be different than a person who's been training in Aikido for 40 years and has reached the level of sixth degree black belt. So it's, it, all, it all depends, right? And so my philosophy of Aikido is, is, for, is moving towards Osensei's philosophy of nonviolence. It's not quite there. It's there in my heart, but in my action and in my mind, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things I do understand is this idea of, that you're trying to achieve in Aikido training is equanimity. That's where something happens and you observe it rather than react to it. And that's really, really difficult because you, in that moment, you, you, you want to react. But you have to train and train and train and train to deprogram yourself from reacting in a conditioned way which is not in line with the philosophies of Aikido, which is very difficult. Right. So it sounds like I didn't really answer the question. Well, is there an example you can you have that would kind of explain that a little bit? Well, let's, you know, ideally, uh, a person attacks you, right? Rather than beat them to a pulp, you, you, you restrain yourself. And that's the training. The training is about restraining your natural tendency, which is to resort to violence. And so when someone attacks you, you... As you develop yourself, you realize, oh man, everyone is suffering. So because every person suffers, just as I do, do I deserve to be destroyed when I make a mistake? And every person who's attacking you is in that moment making a mistake. Right. So, you know, what Osensi is really advocating in this idea of nonviolence is not that you just abstain, right? Because any, there could be so many different forms of violence. You know, there's mental violence. Right? There's verbal violence. It doesn't have to be physical violence, but it's all violence. Any type of any type of resistance is a form of violence. I think that's a very hard concept for people to understand because I mean the thing that jumps out at me when, when you say that is that all these different levels of violence, and I'm sure everyone at this table has heard this, but um, growing up in the United States, we're all roughly the same age, and I can think of this saying, and it sounds overly simplistic, but this um, this sort of nursery rhyme that says, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah. And um, it's pretty prevalent in our culture today about um, people feeling that there are certain words that are causing them distress. Uh, and I feel like there's been a development in our culture about what is causing the difference between emotional violence and physical violence. And I think what you're saying is, is that, um, that viol violence is violence, mm. um, even if there's different levels to it. And um, before the podcast, you and I were talking about what constitutes violence. And um, Second Doshu talks about, in his books, um, The Spirit of Aikido, uh, something that really struck me. And he said... Um, any form of violence, whether justified or unjustified, is unacceptable. And I think that extends what you were saying um, to this huge concept um, that captures everything that you're saying. And I was wondering, maybe you could 
or Mike could expand on that idea of justified versus unjustified. Well, the problem with that statement, you know, it's like if you think about th- that statement that you're talking about, and it came from the spirit of Aikido. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the spirit of Aikido, I think it was Tai Tetsuno that uh, um, translated it. I can look real it's quick. Re- Reverend Uno, who was um, a college professor. Tai Tetsuno. At, tai Tetsuno, a college professor at Smith College. And I believe his, his focus was religious studies. His brother, um, Tetsu Uno, is also a Buddhist priest here in the Los Angeles area. So you would, you would think that their understanding of philosophy is probably pretty good. Um, their command of the Japanese language is uh, probably high. pretty good. Yeah. So, but the question is, what does that mean? So to me, it means that you, know, like, you see like any form of violence is justified or not. It's not acceptable. That's the, that's the goal to strive for. But like you can't give that parameter to a sixth Q, you know, first month Aikido student who lives in, you know, uh, not a very good neighborhood, right? So that any form of violence is not is, is justified or not. So then, how's that person to defend themselves when they don't have the tools to defend themselves? You know, I'm a 50 year old male who lives in a very uh, affluent area who's been doing Aikido for over 30 years. And so I should have a better understanding of that, of Doshi, second Doshi statement than that other person. So you, we can throw that love that out, but that, that is not, po- it's not possible for that person to uh, live that manifest that at their age group right. or, or at their experience level. So I, you know, one of the other things that really hit me about that statement is um O Sensei and Second Doshu were um, lifelong practitioners of Aikido. And um, Second Doshu writes in the spirit of Aikido that Aikido is this sort of summation of the traditional martial arts in Japan, and that it uh, encompassed um, certain schools of jujitsu and swordsmanship. Um, and this statement of unjustified and justified can never be accepted. How do people who are trying to understand the self-defense component of Aikido, how do any of us put the understanding of self-defense within that statement? I mean, I think what you're saying is, is that at different times in your life and in different situations, one's going to have to understand that. But how do you, how do you um, put that in, into the training of, of your teaching? Well, for like first you gotta you have to break some eggs in order to make an omelet. Mm-hmm. For, well, actually, for your sense, you to say you gotta break some arms in order to make an <laughs> omelet. But that's the hard part. Is that like something? Everything. Every person, everything you do is horrible. Is going to be horrible to someone, mm-hmm. right? I think that's what Joseph Campbell said. And so you have to really be careful about that blanket statement because. You're again. You're giving this loaded gun of enlightenment to this person who's not enlightened, not experienced enough to understand the the problem. You know what's the what's the biggest problem? That person might be able to understand what the difference between right and wrong is, but they don't really. Uh, they may understand it intellectually, but in their heart, they can't reconcile it. So you say, you know, um, you're not supposed to steal, but yet this person is starving. Right, but then this person knows that that stealing is wrong, but then their whole family's starving. So Aikido takes this idea of trying to understand the individual, right? So we say this person, this person stole because their family was starving. So then, does it justify us, you know, beating that person to a pulp right. for over a loaf of bread? No, probably not. We should probably give that per- We should probably turn the other cheek and give that person compassion. Right. That man, this person's starving. You know what? Take the bread. Right. You know, I'll I'll put in the two dollars out of my own wallet so that I don't have to kill you over this loaf of bread. Right. So that this idea of of nonviolence is like, it's the goal that you're striving for, but it's not going to be the thing that you're eating today. Right. You have to. I mean, that goal. M- most people will never get there. Was, even O Sensei, at, at a, as a thirty something or a forty something. Was this already an incorporated philosophy of his, or did this come down through his own training and his own enlightenment? You know, 
who's to say he he didn't have that particular philosophy in his twenties, thirties, or forties? Yeah, 40s. he didn't. He, he didn't because and I saw pictures of him in his in his forties, and he looked like a stone cold <laughs> pipe hitter, you know. But that's the hard part, right? We like we end up deifying these people, and then their their end of their life is what we believe our life should be at the beginning of our lives, right? Right. So I read this article on Shin Shin Buddhism. And the person wrote that they don't talk about enlightenment with the children mm. because they can't understand it. And it's not really where they should just focus on trying to be good people. Right. And that until you be, until you can, until you can manifest, you have to learn how to use the sword before you can learn how to put it down. Right. Right. But most people are just, they don't ever end up putting it down because they're too afraid to. There's too much at stake to put the, put the sword down. You know, and there's that famous koan when the the student goes to his sword teacher and says, you know, when are you going to teach me how to use the sword, this sword? And then the teacher says, what is that? And you think he's just being facetious or, you know, being a funny guy. But really, it's that you're supposed to have gone, you've gone so far past it that you no longer need it. So in trying to teach this person a lesson, he says, what is that? Right. Obviously, he doesn't. He didn't forget what the sword was. He's not an idiot, you know. But that, it, that the thing, it's like if I said, you know, get me a wrench, and you brought me a sword, you would say, <laughs> what is that? Right. And it's not because you don't know what it is, but it's that you needed a at that moment you needed a wrench, not a sword. So I'm wondering maybe we could switch gears because, in the spirit of Aikido, and then also in a lot of his poems, O Sensei writes specifically about key. And there's a quote I wanted to read, sort of, because I don't want to, I don't want to summarize it myself and use the uh, second doshi's own words. Um, he, and I'll sort of cut in a little bit into this, but um, second doshi writes, "Oh, sensei concluded that the true spirit of Budo is not to be found in competition and in combative atmospheres where brute strength dominates." And victory comes at any cost. Um, he said, for uh, O-sensei, only true manifestation of Budo can have its reason in the modern world um, when there is the unification of the fundamental creative principle, key, permeating the universe, and the individual key, um, inseparable from breath power in each person. And this last part is, through constant training of the mind and body, the individual key harmonizes with the universal key, um, and this unity appears in the dynamic flowing movement of key power. This is the essence of Japanese martial arts in Aikido. I know that's a lot, but I think he says two things. One is there is harmony with the universe in key, and then there's harmony in the mind and body with key. Yeah. But the, so the, what is your question? So my question is, is um, key is in the name Aikido. Yeah. Um, and maybe the first question is, uh, for people that are attracted to Aikido, maybe we can start by just explaining the name of the art, and then maybe we can talk about the understanding of what it means to have harmony of the individual with the universe, and then what mind-body harmony means. So there's like three pieces to my question. Sorry for how, so much of it, but I think those three things are a key to what Second Doshu thinks his father was talking about. Yeah, but that, that that's the problem is that you to, to understand key, right? So you think, well, what is key? Is matter on the verge of becoming matter? Or is it uh, energy on the verge of becoming matter? Matter on the verge of becoming energy, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and they think about this idea of what is energy, right? And so, it, and then you, well, see, like, it's a very difficult topic to talk about because you start talking, you, you have to talk about, like, absolute key, right? Mm -hmm. The absolute. And then you start really getting into this idea that they're, that they're, that what did we, tr so what is key? Key is, for lack of a better term, energy. Right. Okay. Can't be seen with the naked eye, but everybody, everybody is everything and every per every person and everything is made of key. This table is made of key. Right. It's just this key. That key is not conscious key. We are we are made of key. We are conscious key. Right. And that 
you start to get into this understanding of what is the you're trying to everyone is trying to get back to the absolute right to the the to oneness and so you have to go through all these different spiritual realms of i don't know you call it di- dichotomy or dualism or the thing so how does one how does one fight in a battle you know when if they're if you're trying to become a spiritual person you know that you get drafted into the army what do you do you know but that's the thing is that you're all these things that you're doing you're trying to purify yourself so as you purify yourself day in and day out while living in this dualistic world the more you purify yourself through action at right you know they say right thought right action right speech mm-hmm. right and then as you purify yourself then you become closer to the one and then the the one will only happen when you die and you cross over. But that's the thing is you're trying to get as close to the one as possible before you die. And so Aikido training, you're supposed you're is a form of moving meditation or moving purification as you purify your actions, right? So even though it's a it can be a violent lethal martial art that because of the way you approach it in a in a spiritual way it becomes a spiritual practice right and then that's where all of a sudden it's no longer a vehicle toward the destruction of others the vehicle toward the destruction of mankind it becomes a vehicle towards your own spiritual enlightenment but that thing is that every journey begins with a step that very first day in your first very first aikido class we really can't be talking about spiritualism no <laughs> we got to talk we have to be talking about movement and then through that movement right so the mo- the actions are a metaphor for this for your own key so you know like people say like you everyone brings their stuff to the mat right you bring for your sure. stuff to the mat because there's no talking on the mat so as you move your mind starts to be get, starts to get starts to take over and when it takes over it starts to act a certain way and then when it starts to act a certain way all those fears come out all those things. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of appearing this way. I'm afraid of appearing weak. I'm afraid. Of, I'm afraid that I'm going to be appear afraid. And so, you you have to work that out on the map. Oh, I'm too afraid to take that role. Why? Well, I don't want to get hurt. Why would you get hurt? Well, because I don't know how to roll. I'm teaching you how to roll. <laughs> so then I teach you how to roll in a way in which you learn how to to face your fears and stand up to your your ego. So when your ego says, oh, punch this person in the face, you go, why do I need to punch that person in the face? What did this person do to me? Well, I spilled a drink on you. Don't I make accidents too? I I, I make accidents all the time. And so because I make accidents all the time, do I want somebody to punch me in the face? And then you be, and then you have an existential argument with yourself going, "I, I don't want to punch people in the face. So why am I punching people in the face? You know, so like that's, trying to understand that quote it's like yes you have to develop yourself physically because there's you have to unify the mind your the, the key of your mind and unify the key of your body and what that means is that when you start to move with no no long you moved with without conscious thought right so that subconscious thing the person goes to punch you and your hand automatically moves up and you move in without even thinking about it so that's what they talk about like this this uh, Satsu Jinken, Katsu Jinken, the sword that takes life or the sword that gives life. The sword that gives life kills all on its own. It may be in my hand, but I do not kill. It right. kills. But what happens is I end up killing people with the sword because I'm, I'm, I haven't developed myself. But because I've developed myself, the person moved in and then they, they, were, they were cut, right? And although it was in my hand, it wasn't me who cut that who did person. did it, right. So then see how they really start to get out there existentially. And that's why in the beginning of someone's Aikido training, they really shouldn't talk about spirituality. It's, it's there's too many things going on to even, to even think about that. So it's best they just not talk about it. So that, that, that's an interesting question because uh, if you're a student that's new to Aikido, not even new, let's say you're interested in doing Aikido in America and there are different flavors or styles of Aikido, this is one of the things that becomes, it's potentially an issue, is that there's different styles of Aikido with different emphasis on key. 
Um, could you like maybe just discuss or just summarize what the different styles with respect to key are? They're all the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. I mean, of course, some have, might have some different nuance. You know, Shin Shin Toitsu, uh, Koichi Tohei's style of Aikido, they emphasize the understanding of movement of key more. Yoshinkan is pre-war Aikido, so it's going to be more rough. You know, uh, Tomiki Aikido, I, don't, I think that's post, that's 1960s Aikido, whatever. Yeah. And their focus is on competition, right? And it really comes back to the, the, the philosophy. And if you really think about it, each one of the styles of Aikido are at a different stratification of Osensei's development. Mm. So Yoshinkan is, prior, is pre-war Aikido, right? So it's a little bit rougher. It's a little bit closer to Daitoryu. So if you think Daitoryu is like the pre-Osensei Aikido... And then you have, you know, it moves up the ladder. You know, Shinkan, maybe Tamiki. I don't even know where Tamiki lands in that because I'm not really familiar with their what their philosophical structure is. And then you have Aikikai, which is the style that we practice, right? But even on on in Aikikai style, they don't really discuss um, key that much, and, and rightly so. That on a certain level, people shouldn't be discussing key. Right. Aikido begins as a martial art, but ends up something much, much more. As time goes by, but in the beginning, it's a martial art. I mean, you, you, you people get injured all the time in Aikido. If it was fake, how does that happen? Right. You know, I have two separated shoulders, two hyperextended elbows, five concussions. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff. How'd that happen if Aikido's fake? Right. We're so peaceful. <laughs> We're so peaceful. Yeah. My teacher knocked me out three times, and I slept peacefully while after he knocked me out right mm. but, <laughs> but yeah that's the thing is that what does it mean to be you know that so that's the hard part about like the understanding of key and the philosophy you and then you can go off the deep end mm-hmm. right i mean you really because the thing is that aikido is very eclectic right it has indian philosophy in it it has christian christian philosophy in it, it has japanese philosophy in it um so all these different philosophies are coming together so you really could go off the deep end but really in the end or in the beginning it all it only matters how you move, right? Because the, remember, your movement becomes a metaphor for what's going on inside of you. Your aikido's rough. There's probably something going on upstairs that's all messed up. Until you smooth that out, then your aikido can't smooth out. So I mean, I met a couple people who were like a Buddhist priest and aikidoist, and their aikido always had this softness to it. Hmm. You know, as that person has given up, perhaps their the, the desire to hurt other people. And that's where it really comes back to. So if you think about Tomiki and this, and their desire to compete, that's just Aikidoist at the Q level, right? People from the beginning of their Aikido training to probably like Nidan, second degree black belt, always thinking about, or all they think about is the effectiveness of their movement, hmm. right? Until you can get over that and believe that Aikido can be f- totally lethal, like you would spend, oh, I guess you're you know, thinking about it being effective. Why? Because we're conditioned to look for things that will be the fastest way to knock someone out, the fastest way to put someone down. When you realize it, it that's that's young people's thinking. People, that's why you know you, you don't want to. I don't want to go to a bar where everybody there's 21. That's a bar where there's a fight that breaks out every 30 seconds. Why? Because those people have never drank before, and their testosterone's going through the roof. You bump into them, they're. Ah! Over nothing. Like, who, what adult person wants to go to a bar with 20 somethings? None of them, right? So then that's where you think about the evolution of the, of the Aikidoist. When I was uh, in like a Shodan, man, I used to go to like, you know, punk rock shows and all this stuff, jump, go in the mosh pits. That was, I love that stuff. Today I was like, ugh, no, I don't, <laughs> absolutely. Let's, I don't even want, I don't even want to. You could turn your radio up to 11, but I don't want anybody. I don't want to listen to music at that cranked up to that level, right? But that's that thing is that you your desire to be um, effective, to be to, to be able to beat people up, to defend yourself and all those things, those are just aspects of your ego. Does that also involve an insecurity? Yeah, you know, your, your ego. So later on, as you develop yourself, you realize, oh, it doesn't even need to be that way. But then in that, but at that time, right? She broke up with me. I'm gonna kill everybody in the room. But then later on, you go, uh, another person broke up with me. Not that big a deal. Let's go. That's eat. How love goes. Yeah, but that's the hard part, right? Let me ask you a question. Um, 
I mean, you, if, if you start reading a lot about Aikido and, and some of the exercises, uh, this word comes up, misogi. And if you see old pictures of O-sensei um, sometimes doing exercises with a Joe, um, what is misogi and how does it relate to the philosophy of Aikido? Well, again, it's this purification. So you have to remember, like, um, people prior to World War II were very uneducated. Right, so you tell them, "Hey, there's a ghost out there." Oh, they're ghosts. You tell them, "Hey, there, your relatives come back during Obon. You better clean this place up." Oh, I better, I gotta clean this place up, whether that's true or not. Like they're 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 just thinking that the evil key is all around us. That's what makes us sick, right? And so that that I think in Chinese it's she key or something like that. But it's a but that the evil key. Uh, is all around us. It causes us to get sick, act, you know, and it gets in our heads and act, gets us to think and act a certain way. So, misogi is are, are uh, uh, certain exercises that we use to purify ourselves. And so today, th- then we call that you know it's it's misogi. You're you're in a waterfall. You're praying. You're meditating. Today we're doing salt rubs, uh, essential oils, <laughs> uh, stone and crystals, and all that type of stuff. But, you know, really, it's just the pure... I mean, why do people wear crystals, right? Oh, to block uh, negative energy coming and going, to do all the... It's the same reason, right? Same thing. But it's just the idea that to that you're trying to purify your mind. So if any of you... If you've ever done any cold water training, you get into that thing, man. <laughs> I got to get you last like eight seconds. Ah, how long was that? Eight seconds. Oh, darn it. How long are we supposed to sit in there? An hour, right? And so... You can, you're going to go into the, the Nachi Falls in Japan and, and, and meditate. You have to slow your mind down, slow yeah. your heart down, slow your breathing down. And that purification is what you're really – what you're, you're doing is purifying your body in that moment, but you're teaching yourself how to react to stress so that when that thing happens, you don't just you know kill everyone in the room and go, oh, what happened? <laughs> Where's this blood from? You know, you don't go sucky bloodlust, right? That you, 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 uh, you purify yourself. And so, if you think about like breathing exercises, are really, really important, and they don't really talk about them in Aikido much anymore. But breathing, so there's a place for every every level of Aikido. There's a place for Yoshinkan. There's a place for Tomiki. There's a place for Aikikai. It all depends on where you are as a human being, right? So when you're gonna you're gonna go off and you're gonna. Um, purify yourself then what are you trying to purify yourself from like oh you got to have a problem that you're going to go get pure. rid of most people don't they go oh, i saw pictures of osensei sitting in a, in a waterfall with wearing his uh um japanese style underwear and then a bandana on his head i'm gonna go do that too but then you have you have to be when, while you're in that waterfall doing that those that purification thing or while you're sitting in the ichikukai dojo you know sitting there for six straight hours on your knee in Seiza, like you're trying to get rid of some stuff. And the thing you're trying to get rid of is this negative, this negativity that human beings have naturally as a survival mechanism. Don't eat that berry. And you go, yeah, I probably shouldn't eat that berry. Because if you're just like, where it's super positive, eat all the berries you want. You die. You die, right? (laughs) We have to have that negativity in order to survive as as prehistoric humans but today we realize we don't need that because we have intelligence we are we have we have conscious thought oh i could look at that berry and i i took a class and now i know if i should eat that berry or not right before it was like it's a gamble and we all sat around and we gave it to the the dumbest guy in the group mikey will eat it um, oh darn okay don't eat that one don't <laughs> eat that one right as neanderthals but then that's the idea is that when you're you're going to go do those things, you got to be serious because it's not a one-time deal, right? They, I can't remember what they call it, but they they call it something like retreat enlightenment or something like that, where you go off to retreat for 10 days and you're like, oh, we're doing all these great things and everything's great. And then when you come down from the mountain, you're like, oh my God. Re-entry. You're, you're, yeah, that re-entry, it's so sickening because no one's living that way, Yeah. right? But that's the hard part, like right? where you want to be able to develop yourself and so these misogi exercises, because remember, misogi comes from this idea of this of Shintoism, right? So Shintoism is very much balanced by by nature. So you know they use salt as purifications. They think you know <clears throat> making these um, 
shidome, the paper things, and they put mm-hmm. them around the trees, sure. will, will keep, block out the negative spirits and stuff like that. So if they believe that type of thing where there's a spirit or an evilness, then it's not really you. And so you have to kind of, but then think about this idea that you're going to be doing something like meditating on sitting in Seiza for eight straight hours or going under a waterfall for a whole hour. You kind of need to be committed to that, right? And so you have to be, it's not for this person who's like, you know, I love killing people and I'm just going to do it. And then I come out of there a, a stronger killer. No, it's a, while you're in there, you're, you, the thing that you're really defeating is your own mind. Right. The negativity of your key of your mind. And then you're sitting there going, no, no, no. The, this is not the way. This is not the way. So that in the moment when someone attacks you, you'll have the bandwidth to go, I don't need to kill this person. It's just a loaf of bread. But today we don't have that. Right. Morality. And, you know, you were asking earlier about philosophy and religion. Right. So the Dalai Lama said you can be spiritual, but not religious, but you can't be religious and not spiritual. Right. Mm. Right. So you have to have this, you have to have something. If if Aikido teaches you this lethal martial as, as a lethal martial art. Right. It's irresponsible. So there has to be something balanced because you can't just be going around choking people. Right. Right. Like a bunch of my buddies went to the police department and. One of the things they learned in that in the nineties was choke choke hold. Hold, yeah. And so all they did is every time they got in a fight, they just choked choke the hold. person out and we were at a bar. Right? <laughs> so, their go to. <laughs> yeah, their, their go to technique was choking <laughs> choking that dude out. But the thing is that what you don't realize is like you gave him a tool but no responsibility. Yeah. Right. So Aikido gives you the tool and the responsibility. I mean, you every every one of the techniques in Aikido is lethal. Right, it's supposed to be lethal. They're supposed to, you know, b- lock right. the joint, break, break the it. joint, and then throw you and then kill you. And you think, oh, well, why why don't they do that today? Well, one of the reasons why they don't do that today is because how who could handle it? Well, I broke your shoulder. Oh, all right, Bill. See you in six years when it's all healed and you're done with physical therapy, and then you come back. You're there for two weeks, and we do the other side. And I mean, it seems ridiculous, right? Because you realize that violence in itself is ridiculous. I'm a mature human being. I can't use my words. You hurt my feelings. Please don't do that anymore. Oh, I'm sorry you, that I hurt your feelings. I won't do that anymore. Right. But what ends up happening is I just go, and I growl at, at you when you walk by, and you go, I'm going to get that guy. And then you go, why is that guy all mad? Well, if he's going to be mad at me, I'm going to be mad at you. And then a problem is all because as adults, no one taught us to say, Hey, what you did hurt my feeling. Right. Let me ask you a question. Kind of, this kind of comes off this a little bit. We talked about it earlier. Where does ego fit within Aikido philosophy and training? Well, that's the thing that you're constantly, in all traditional uh, Japanese arts, Aikido, Judo, tea ceremony, flower, Ikebana flower arrangement, <clears throat> uh you know, rock arranging or whatever it is, every traditional Japanese art is really all about the suppression of the ego. So that's why the master is supposed to come into the room and you're performing, you know, like let's say t and then the master kicks the door and goes, oh, you're horrible, get out of here, and then does the the, the, the tea ceremony for you. You're a a traditional doctor, you're treating patients and then the, tea, the master comes and kicks the door, you're so horrible, get out of here. And then all the while giving you more and more information, giving you more and more tasks to perform, all the while telling you you're horrible. Oh, my God, you should just quit. And then you think, God, I'm just a horrible one. Well, I just I got no place else to go. I'll just keep cleaning this place up. I'll keep doing what he tells me to do. And then you start growing in stature without knowing it. And then what ends up happening is that one day your teacher no longer kicks the door in on you. And then you go, oh, wow, what happened? And then you turn around and the teacher dies. And then you're like, I'm the teacher. And everybody goes, you're the teacher. And you go, me, but I'm the worst one. Right. And then your ego, you have to realize that all the teacher was trying to do is suppress the, keep your ego at bay. Because that's the thing. That's the killer. That kill, the ego is the 100% uh, killer, right? Like every, every person who trains will be confronted with their own ego. And then their ego will tell them, hey, you should be the teacher. Hey, you should be doing You're that. the best. Hey, you shouldn't let people talk to you like that. Hey, hey. And then you're, you, go, you go crazy, right? And, you, and that's where 
the, the, when you think about the all traditional training is trying to do is suppress that ego. So since since that kind of older style training is pretty hard in the United States to pull off. It's hard anywhere now. Right. So what what is a good replacement for that type of training that still achieves similar results? Intelligence. Intelligence. You have to say to yourself, oh, that was really rude that I said that. Mm, I got to stop doing that. Oh, that was really bad. I got to stop doing that. Hey, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to break your arm. I'm... You you have to self regulate. You're gonna to have to self regulate, because so, you know, self, being self aware. Yeah, self aware and self regulate. Because now that the, before the teacher would regulate, point out you didn't bow one time. Fuyu Sensei said to me, um, I was coming in the dojo for something, and he said you didn't bow, and I said yes I did, and he goes you, and he just went off on me. <laughs> you talking back, and I was just like dress me down in front of everybody. Yeah, and in my heart I was like. Why would he do that? Right. These other guys, they talk talk back all the time. These other guys, they just give the, the cursory neck no. bow. I could have sworn I bowed. But that, and the thing is, you, I don't, and if you think about it in a, in a more um, broader sense, maybe I did bow. And that sensei wanted to check someone else in the class who could, he couldn't check, so he checks me. But then by checking me, that enables me to also uh, check myself. And then, you know, I think, well, maybe I didn't bow. Oh, I don't know. Or it, it enables me to just go to be a good student and say, hi, which I didn't do because I was like, I did bow. No, you're wrong. I, no, I no, First and, mistake. Yeah, first mistake. <laughs> the first word out of your mouth has to be hi, right? And, you know, that's where they say, like, the, the, the amount of time it takes – from when the teacher calls you and then you say hi is the amount of ego you have. David, hi. That's how much ego you have. So if he goes, David, you go, hi. You stand up like this, looking around. But most people, David, hi. But it's supposed to be like this. David, hi. And you sit up. Like ready for, ready, ready to for, go. Ready to go. That means that you have no ego. But that's the hard part today that is that we eat most of that training is done under duress. Right. Most of that training is done to, you know, smash your ego. You have, that's what they say. You got to smash that person's ego. And I was like, oh my gosh. So like I was having lunch with a Zen priest and he told me the story that whenever the new priest comes into the temple, the senior priests always treat them harshly. And I was like, what did you do that for? And he said, because... To suppress, to to teach, train that person, and to suppress their ego, and I said, "What if they don't have a problem? What if they don't?" He's like, "Every person's got a problem. a problem, right?" And I go, "What if that creates animosity later?" He's like, "Well, that's something they got to work on." And you're like, "Damn, that's right?" Rough. But that's that thing, like that. The teacher's job was to smash your ego, so that you could learn. Because your ego is the thing that which is it, the ego is the thing which prevents us from everything. The ego is the thing that prevents us from being happy. The ego is the thing that prevents us from um, doing the things that we want to do. To from being good at Aikido to be good at driving a car or whatever. It's your ego. You know, see, if you got in the car and you went, "Oh, it's a car I've never driven one before," and you're like, woo, 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 crashing and stuff, and you're like, "This is kind of fun." But what happens is you go, oh, I, I feel stupid because I don't know how to drive a car because I've never driven one before. And that person and every, laughed at me. And everyone's judging me. And I don't know if, oh, gosh, I don't think everybody, oh, no. All those other things you you heaped onto just driving the car that you've never driven before comes into play. And so it's the same thing with the martial arts. If you could just come in and be like, I've never done a martial art before. And you go, okay, move it like this. Oh, okay. But what happens is your mind goes, I feel stupid. Right. I'm not very good. Everybody here's looking at me. Everyone's laughing inside. Does this work? The, does this work? I'll never get good. I'll the uh, ah! and then everyone's standing there looking. And you go, yeah, just move forward, and then they can't. And that's the that's the that's why the 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 ego is the thing that you're most trying to learn how to control in training. It it seems to me that that ego is a very Western. I mean, you know, Freud broke down the mind without any sign. From a psychological point of view, they have the superego, ego, and id. Yeah. And in Western psychology, ego is a very positive 
rational um, structure. Yeah. And do you, as a martial arts teacher, do you think it's just a very different conception? Uh, well, the, the, the Westerners gave it a name and cataloged it. In, in the East, it's mind versus no mind, thought okay. versus no thought, right? That you're trying to get to this, this state of mushin, right? No, no thought to where you can just, a person pulls out a knife and attacks you and you just moved Respond. in and responded. But what happens is that person pulls out the knife, you scream inside, right? And then you freak out and then a, a tussle ensues. Were, were we talking about, I think it was you and I that were talking about how, maybe it was the last podcast where we were talking about the amount of information you can you can oh, process yeah. versus when you it's when you have a certain brain wave versus yeah. a different one. Well, but that's the the subconscious state is really mushin. Right. But the thing is, you want to try to get there almost on a regular basis to where you, you walk around in mushin. Right. So someone says, "Hey, you want to take a bite of this apple? What is this?" You take a bite. Wow, it tastes excellent. Yeah, that's why I brought up this sort of Freudian mental structure. Is is I think that. This idea of mushin, even though there's a huge development of psychological models in Western thought beyond Freud now, I think Freudian psychological structure is still the sort of layman's way of looking at psychological structure. But this idea of mushin and the power that comes from it um, is not as well known, even though people in the West, I mean, look at martial arts training and and the popularity of Zen uh, as something they, they like to incorporate. A lot of people want to incorporate it. Yeah, like, a lot of people like to think that, that they like to incorporate, but they never will. You have to spend so much time. and, and Zen is a thing in, in itself. Right. Just as swordsmanship is a thing in itself. So to combine the two, like... Endless road? Yeah, it's it's a, it's an endless road because there's... There, there, there are obstacles at every turnoff, and then you, you have to work on it. And then compound that with Aikido and Yaido and this and that and a family life and all those different things. Like, mm. yeah, like people say, oh, I want to I want to study Zen. And you, and you think that everyone says they want to study Zen. Yeah, we all want to be Zen'd out, no, <laughs> mushin'd out. But it, it, that's... Impossible. It, well, it's not. It's not it's impossible. Difficult. It's, it's, very, it's difficult. very difficult. Like I said, it's difficult in just if you're just doing Zen, but if you're just, but if you're trying to incorporate, wrap, wrap your Aikido training, you know, wrap Zen around your Aikido training, you're making it even more difficult. Well, let me ask you a question though, because maybe this is a good, a good question to like, it's almost like a summary question. Why, why do, especially Westerners, even though I think Zen was very attached to Japanese martial artists, why do you think West people in the West, especially, see Aikido? I mean, Aikido did have some connections to Buddhism, but why do people think that there is this very direct connection between Zen and Japanese martial arts? Because that's what people talk about, right? And that's and then you got to realize that it was the '60s when Aikido came over here, right? So it, it was it was easily adopted by people that are running around. Um, peace, love, and harmony, baby. Peace, yeah, peace, love, and for hippies, for lack of a better word. But is there is there something, and I don't want to get too far on a tangent, but is there some key element of Zen that people latch onto that they think is in Japanese martial arts or Aikido specifically? It, I don't think it's that it's they're latching onto it because it's part of the martial arts. But the thing that every person is trying to achieve is peace, inner mm. peace, mm -hmm. right? So someone says, "Oh, it, it's inner peace." For your, you know, study this, you'll get inner peace. Read this book, you'll get inner peace. You know, seven ways to become a, become more peaceful. You know, the inner game of tennis and all these things. Like the thing that you're trying to be, you're trying to achieve in this in this lifetime is inner peace, mm. right? Where you you don't you just the guy the kid at the grocery store, it doesn't doesn't wreck your day. But yeah, most of us, the kid at the grocery store says one terse word and it ruins your off. day, yeah. ruins your week. And that you're trying to get to a place where those things don't matter anymore. And right. so that you can become zenned out, right? But really, 
you have to you, it's the tur like you said the sticks and stones may break my bones right it's it's the same thing a terse word a punch they're no all the same right you have to learn to negotiate each one as a i don't know an, uh a person who lives in this world and that's where we come back to this idea of dualism and oneness as you develop yourself in du in a dualist in this dualistic world you learn how to become more like the one mm -hmm. and then as you develop yourself toward that one the kid at the grocery store who says that terse thing to you it just doesn't affect you so is is there something about the philosophy of aikido that you wish you knew or someone told you early on in your Aikido career that might have changed in a positive way? No, because I heard that I heard it all. You heard it all. But I just I could I could you could I can understand it up here in my head, but I really couldn't understand it down here in my heart. I not until my ch my son was born did I realize what the true meaning of martial arts was. That Shimu Fusatsu, that true Budo does not kill. Because everybody is somebody's baby, hmm. right? And if someone hurt my baby, it would kill me. Yeah. So then why would I do that to someone else? So then if that's true, then nonviolence is really the place you want to be in. Right. You know, disarming a person with your, with a, with your words and kindness over destroying them with your fists. So it's not that, that I wish I'd have known that before, I knew it intellectually, but I didn't know it spiritually, emotionally, to where you could realize, like, man, if someone hurt, would hurt, was was to hurt my baby, it would destroy me. Right. But so then, why am I do everybody someone baby? So then, why am I doing it to other people? Right. Well, like then, Guy Ritchie said, you, people only glean what they're ready to glean. Yeah. So like, it's not. I'm not really ready. Those things I just wasn't really ready to to understand, and that's why I truly believe that. Like, you gotta. You got to go through all those hells. You got to go through smashing people on the mat and getting smashed to realize that I don't really need to smash yeah. anybody. You know, but I mean, that's the hard part where, you know, you could read all these books, but you can't, you, you have to experience them. That's right. what, you know, right. what's the definition of wisdom when knowledge meets experience, right? So when, when you, when knowledge meets experience, then you can stop acting that way. Right. But how do you tell an eight-year-old kid? Uh, how do you tell a twenty-year-old kid who snuck into a bar and got all drunk, who's super filled with testosterone, not to get in a fight because it doesn't really matter, and that he not, he's not really in love with that girl? Right. Right. You can't. You just have to arrest that person and then hope that this arrest doesn't sets them on the right path and doesn't ruin their life. Right. But that's why people shouldn't drink until they're twenty-one. They shouldn't do these things until they're. You know, this because you're just not ready for it, right. right? So if you're allowing people to smoke, smoke pot, drink, do drugs before the, a certain development, developmental age, you're giving them something which they're not going to be responsible for, right? Right. right. If, you know, if you, my kids can't throw anything in their hampers, right? But I'm going to give them a gun. Come on, man! Like, you know, <laughs> and that's that's our part. It's like, yeah, give people. Uh, let them drive a, a you know one ton vehicle down the highway. This my kids can't even you know ride their bike. <laughs> yeah, they can't even flush the toilet when they're done. And then here I am like, oh, you should have a gun. There's no way that, that I give my kid like you know they're like, can I have a knife? I'm all no. <laughs> You're eight years old. I know I'm responsible. I go you don't you, you don't even throw your cl your clothes in the hamper on a regular basis. How do I, why would I should I give you something which can kill someone right? And so. That's that thing is that you to understand what real what what is the, what is the spirit of Aikido? Yes, the spirit of Aikido is nonviolence, compassion, things like that. But at every level of the game, from the bottom to all the way up, you have you have to learn things in layers. You have to learn it's it's not okay to hurt people. You have to learn it's not okay to do this. You have to learn that this is a better way to do things, and that's why at the highest level. You really want to just be a good person that knows how to use their words, which is such the hard thing. You just, I'll show you. Yeah. It's just say, instead of saying, I'm a little bit sad inside because my mom died last night. 
but instead you just want to punch somebody in the face. Why? Because you can't, you're so emotional, you can't use your words. But that's the thing is that today, when you asked earlier about the modern person who isn't willing or doesn't have the opportunity to go through hard training, if you don't have that, then you really must be in control of your mind a little bit better because you could read all these books, but it's not going to help you try to understand in your heart what it means not to hurt someone. Right. But that's why most people stop wanting to hurt people after someone hurts them. So it's, you know, you can read about it all day long, but unless it's put into practice, a disciplined practice, yeah. it, are you going to be able to glean it? No. I don't think you can. No. Right? Well, what, is, what does a souffle taste like? I have no idea. But then you can describe it to me. Oh, it's like this and like this, and it's so creamy. And then I go, oh, it's going to be like that. And then I eat it and I go, oh. It's nothing like they said. It's just chocolatey, <laughs> right? But that's the hard part. With we have to be able to to marry our experience with our knowledge, and then that's where we become wise person. Don't touch that pot; it's hot. And then that person goes, "No, it's not." <laughs> and then that person tells others, "Don't touch that pot. Hot pot, bad." And then they stop doing that. But until that point, like you have to just go. Oh, I guess you won't have to touch that. So I know things have changed since the three of us started Aikido, and you started a little bit earlier than me, but Mike and I started roughly at the same time. I think I started in 93. Did you start in 93? I uh, started in 91 in Westminster. All right, so you actually started earlier than I did. Um, do you think that, um, that pe- people who are, let's say, in, in their teens or, or maybe early 20s that are potentially starting Aikido right now, that the lower attention spans and exposure to certain types of media potentially um, may have a harder time starting this kind of training. Maybe. You know, I was having this discussion with Watanabe Sensei yesterday, and I believe that the same amount of people walk this earth, the same percentage of people walk this earth. You know, the, uh, who was it? Um, Heracles said that uh, of an army of a hundred, there's a certain percentage that shouldn't be here. There's a certain percentage that are just cannon fodder. Uh, there's a certain percentage that are fighters, but only like 1% are true Hardcore. warriors. Yeah. And so I think that's that's no different than it is from the 50s to today that every, it's the numbers are the same. It's just that you, you have to, Aikido is like Aikido graduate school, as Doi Sensei says, right? Until you're ready not to, until you're ready to not destroy other people, you know, pounding someone's face into, uh, you know, tomato sauce, like until you do that once, you go, I don't want to do that, man. Right. And it's 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 not an untenable situation. You can't keep that up. Right. How you can't be walking around just like you know beating people to the pulp because that guy shorted you five cents of change. You know, you can't because that guy scraped your bumper. You can't you can't be beating that person up. Right. It's human nature to be aggressive and like that because of where we came from as prehistoric people. There was payoffs. Yeah. But today violence. there's no payoff for that. It's we you do you want to live next door to a guy who regularly uh, beats up the other neighbors for playing their music too loud? You know, it's it's interesting. I've read this is slightly off the topic of philosophy, but I've read that. You know, even though that at any given time in human history, there's always been some war taking place. But since the end of World War II, there's been no significant large combat um, taking place. And I'm wondering, do you, th- I mean, is it your sense that, um, that because of the way communities have developed and, you know, philosophies like Aikido, that there is a greater opportunity worldwide for peaceful relationships between human beings. Well, I think also, too, because now we have this thing called a nuclear weapon. So if there was a big war like that to happen, that could be brought into play. So well, there's always a the fear that, oh, let's not go there. Well, they call that looping. You, you, you yell at me, I yell at you. You bring a knife, I bring a knife. You bring a gun, I bring a gun. You bring a tank, I bring a tank. You bring a nuclear bomb, I, they call it looping. It's called, you know, like, but that's this idea that, like, one would think that why do we still continue to fight in wars 
when we are so developed intellectually. Hmm. This is the, 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 we, we are, as human beings, we are the most sophisticated We've ever and been. technologically advanced that we have ever been in the, in the history of mankind. And yet we are no better than, you know, the people a thousand years ago. The 16th century Sengo, Sengoku period in Japan is no different than today, right? Unbridled passion, you know, killing people for, for you know, for Land, whatever reason. Food. And so that's the hard part is that, like, we have to use our minds and our intellect in the proper way, which is not just, you know, saying some funny, mean thing to some person's YouTube video on Aikido that they made. You know, someone, someone wrote, you guys are a bunch of clowns. And you go, thanks. You know, and you, I bet you if you follow that internet thread back to that person's thing, they're like an eight-year-old kid or something, 13-year-old boy. <laughs> you think, what a jerk. Right? But then... That's how that's how forty or fifty six year old people are acting, right? Right. So they today, because there's no hard training. In the old days, there was hard training, right? Right. You 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 would never back talk the the, the teacher. No. If you did, the well, senior students would beat you up, or the teacher would beat you up. Right. One time when I was when we were so, I was a student, uh, neither of you that were there. But the student told Sensei that he didn't think Aikido was was oh, effective. No. Oh, I heard that oh, story. No. <laughs> and and Sensei got you know got Furious. mad, and of course he didn't say anything to the rest of us. So he comes downstairs and then just Unloads. murders us. There's a I have one of my rhomboids on the right side of my shoulder. Sensei tore out tore, and it was torn for because it's one of those muscles that you just can't heal. And it took, God, tw- six months. No, mm. like ten years. Oh my to god! To heal. Whenever I would get stressed, my mm-hmm. shoulder that 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 in that one area would hurt, and yeah, I mean it had to have been ten years. That it took to, it took for it to heal, but I mean since he threw one person, and the person flew right in front of the door and almost out the door. The door. It was like, you know, one of those comedic things where since he's so mad, he throws this guy across the room and the guy went probably 15 to 20 feet and he almost skidded out Out the the door. door. (laughs) And, you know, one guy went into an um, an asthma, had had an asthma attack. I mean, people were beating the crap out of us. To where the point where the the guy who was uh, do, the dojo doctor at the time was like like sensei sensei he's tapping because my when sensei was pinning me my hand my arm was trapped under just, was trapped under my body and, and you're like making a light tap yeah, and, and, I, and and then the guy was like sensei sensei he's tapping and then like sensei just can lay waste to that room full of old oh. black belts only. And then that, that guy who was the doctor had to, like, administer all this first aid care afterwards, all because someone guy. Who, who wasn't me or anyone that was in that room, that guy went home, said that, and since he decimated us. I mean, he, I just remember some of the techniques. I mean, he's like, eating me nage, straight up smash in the face. For mine, it was, I was supposed to do shomenuchi, accidentally did yokomenuchi, so he, he threw me down kodagaishi and then just Toy wrenched, wrenched my shoulder in the pin. I mean, God, like, but that's the thing. There's no one, there aren't people like that anymore right. to where, and then not that anyone would take that, that you couldn't really smart off to. Right. You know, like, oh, Aikido's fake. Oh, what? You know, like in the, in the 60s and 70s, if you did, you said that, you might, you might have to fight somebody. Right. But today, you know, you just type on the internet, Aikido's fake, you guys are a bunch of clowns. An, uh, anonymous. If you were such a, a tough guy about it, drive down, down there and say something. But you, you're not. This It's the internet, right? It was, it's very was, safe. Yeah, the internet it was designed to slander others anonymously. But that's yeah. the hard part. Like you, So if, if those, st- those structures don't exist to where a person will treat you harshly in order to develop you, then... You have to use your intellect to, to develop, develop to develop yourself while that while you train to develop yourself. But most people can't do that. But with all the intellect in the world, if you're not self aware to know that you're being like that, does it even matter whether you're intellectual? Well, there's that blissfully unaware, right? I I don't have a problem, so there's no problem for me to work on. Well, that's right. cool. Then go someplace else. If you just want to beat people up, go someplace else. 
right? This, this, this seems to like bring us back to what we started with, which was Aikido, nonviolence, justified, unjustified. Yeah. But I think it's, uh, I think this is a great place for us to sort of consider everything we said in the whole session because we, we started and we're ending in, this, in the same place. Yeah. Um, and I think the discussion we're having here is that, is that the, what you said in the very beginning, which is people are at different places along the way. And uh, Mike talked about it, you talked about it, that there is this understanding that the discipline is your training. And um, I was just curious if after this whole discussion, you wanted to revisit that and kind of summarize for us what you think this is all about. Well, but that's 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 the hard part is that you have to have the patience. You have to have the discipline to be patient enough to do something and wait for the return on your investment, mm -hmm. which which may not come for years or decades. Mm -hmm. But it's that moment where you're almost mugged, you're almost something happens, and then you realize, wow, I didn't freak out. Right. Oh, I guess my Aikido training does work. As opposed to, I, I want to be able to uh, train and then go to a bar and get drunk and not be pushed around by people bigger than me. Right. And then, so then the question is, why do you need to go to a place where you'll be in that situation, right? You know, like so somebody said um you win every fight that you don't get into right right so you're going to go down to the biker bar you're going to you're going to go down to the <laughs> thing and, and and then wonder why you're always getting into a fight you know uh, some of the old uh uchideshis from home dojo in the 60s would used do to, that used to go to kabuki cho and the slight in those days was to step on the shoe of a yakuza person no and then because a Yakuza person, you could fight them and then they won't go to the police. Right. And so some of these Ushijeshis would go down to uh, Kabukicho and purposely step on the shoe of a Yakuza person so that they could fight them and see it test their Aikido. But that's the hard part, right? Like if you're you, – today, you know, if you want it for really thinking about bringing it back to this idea of, of violence and it not being acceptable – it's not acceptable at all, but until you can realize that it's not acceptable, then it's just going to be acceptable. Right. Right. Like it, it, how often do people cheat on their taxes until they realize it's not acceptable? Right. How often do people do these things until they realize it's not acceptable? Right. And that's the hard part is that training is supposed to teach you, teach you what is acceptable. It teaches you that anyone, anyone can kill anyone at any time. Right. And that life is precious. So if life is precious, then why do you got to go around acting like a acting like a jackass, right? And then you don't, and so you you don't because it it all the well all the while trying to understand second doshu's um, assertion about n n violence of any sort is not acceptable, right? But you know what happens if I'm drafted into the military? Well, Joseph Campbell talked about this in one of his things is that then you have to do you must participate but in the most decent way possible. Yeah. And so that's really difficult for people to understand that. So then when you begin Aikido training, you shouldn't, you being effective and defending yourself is on your mind, but you should also keep your eye on the idea that O Sensei is trying to teach you, which is nonviolence is the way to go. Right. Nonviolence is the real strength. Having the restraint not to, that's true discipline. Anyone can smash anyone's face in. Anyone can hit another person with a bat. Anyone can pull a trigger, maybe not well, but but not every person can not act when they really really want to. Right. And so that restraint is the true true power. And so the philosophy of Aikido is nonviolence, but the, really the thing that you're trying to you're trying to nonviolence is just a concept. What it really comes down to is: Do you have the discipline to be restrained? To just to, to restrain yourself from doing something you're going to regret, and that's really hard for human all human beings, no matter what what they what they train in or do or anything like that. 
Can you not eat that piece of pizza when you're trying to lose weight? Can you not beat that person up because they spilled a drink on your shoe? Can you not chase that person on the freeway because they cut you off? Can you say thank you even though that person was rude to you? Right. It's discipline. And that's the hard thing that... But in order to, and then the, the thing is, the rub is, in order to achieve anything in this life, one must have discipline, no matter if it's Aikido, a law degree, and that's what the power that Aikido gives you in the training, is it teaches you discipline. So, Sensei, do you think um, that's a good thought for us to wrap up on? Sure. I think that's a good thought. Um, that's a, well, someone watching and listening, it's, that's quite a bit to a digest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for watching this podcast, and don't forget to like and subscribe, and please follow us on the social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.